It started off very intense. It's remained very intense. Yeah. It's been a human grind emotionally since the beginning. It started with a lot of human suffering up close that we could see, that we could go to these kibbutzim, we could meet the people who had lost loved ones, who had people kidnapped. And there's still so much suffering inside Israel, but now a lot of the suffering concentrated in Gaza. We're seeing it from afar. I think the, the, the real challenge for us is to tell the Gaza story without being inside of Gaza mm -hmm. unilaterally. So you can go on IDF embeds, you did one or two even, two. I think. Uh, but that's, that's obviously imperfect in the sense that you have escorts with you uh, all the time. At some point, I hope that we're gonna be able to get in unilaterally, independently, and report because the courageous teams on the ground who are sending us the material, without them, we couldn't tell any of the story. So at least we're getting something, but we're not getting as much of the picture as, as we'd like. And that's a huge challenge because ultimately, especially TV reporting, all reporting, but TV reporting is about face-to-face -face access. Yeah. And you don't get the, the story the same way over Zoom. You don't, you just don't. And it's even hard to do the Zooms, for example, because the yeah. comms have deteriorated so much there. So how are you communicating with people in Gaza? Explain that to an audience back home. Everybody's texting, everybody picks up the phone, and it's an instant connection. That's not the case here. You hear from people so intermittently. Mm -hmm. They text you, you text them back straight away, and then it's three days of silence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you wonder, are they still alive? What's happened to them? And the reality, and a lot of times, they just, they can't get connection, you know? You have to be super aware that as much as you wanna hear everything from these people, you know, they're trying to keep their families alive, they're trying to find food. I mean, we're seeing that with the other hat that I wear back home in Washington, this daylight here, this distance between the US, this very obviously close and strong ally of Israel, and Israel, what they wanna see in, in what's next from Gaza. You referenced other conflicts you've yeah. covered, Hala. You, you've covered this region for decades. Explain that, what does feel different now than then? Well, I think the extent of the damage, the, the displacement of 90% of the population, this is not a territory that is going to be habitable after this. It's already not habitable. When the war ends, and it will end, are the, the conditions that led to this conflict going to change? One of the things that has struck me being here just for a very short period of time is how much the families of people who are still being held in captivity want to talk. Yeah, it's so interesting. They feel like they need to humanize their loved ones. They don't want the world to forget about these now 135 or so people who are still in Gaza. But it's also just, it's somewhere for people to put their energy. Mm. They can't help their mothers, brothers, sisters who are inside Gaza. They can't go rescue them. What can they do? They can talk and they can talk and they can sit down with journalists and they can answer painful questions. The hardest thing for me to do as a journalist is speak to the family member of someone who's died. We're in kind of emergency uh, kind of ER room mode when we're covering the story, but then we have those quiet moments when we're actually screening the footage. And that sometimes you can really cry and break down because this is the worst nightmare that any of us can imagine living through. And you are time and again asking it of someone else to share. And I worry about myself when I'm in autopilot and I don't cry. I worry about myself. Mm. I check myself. Yeah. Like, why, am I, why haven't I cried in two weeks? Many of my friends are foreign reporters and do the same job that I do. One of my female, well-known female correspondent friends said, I haven't cried yet and it's been a month. And, I'm, and, and we kind of wonder what's going on. Is there a story or an interview that you can't shake? Is there something that is the thing that you're thinking about in those quiet moments at night when you're not working? There is a little boy who was kidnapped, uh, was taken into Gaza. His name is Ohad Munder. He was eight years old when he was kidnapped. He turned nine in captivity. And we sat down with his cousin, and the cousin mentioned that Ohad's father was in agony, not knowing whether his son had his glasses or not, because this little boy can't see without his glasses. And the thought of this little kid in those tunnels, afraid, not able to see. And Ohad came out on one of the first days, and he had his glasses. That's funny, because it's sometimes the 
most random detail that makes you reminds you of the humanity eventually not you but eventually i'm gonna go to the airport i'm gonna hop on a flight and i'm gonna go to my family and I'm, it's gonna be christmas and we're gonna you know have a nice meal and whatever and you're gonna feel this tremendous guilt that you left and the people behind remained and that's something very difficult to explain my brain is in the suffering of the people, and I feel guilty. You're here, you're based here, and so when October 7th happened, you were what, at home asleep? I was at home asleep, yeah. woke up, there's the dull thuds of rockets overhead, there's the sirens going off. I texted two of our bosses, and I said, hey, sorry for the early morning text. There's what looks like a surprise attack, mm. and we got to this checkpoint on one of the main highways. You know, if you imagine, I-95 or something, and there's just soldiers improvising a checkpoint using their cars. So we set up and we started doing our first live shots from one of these checkpoints, and the soldiers were so amped, they were so panicked, I would say, and they were dragging anyone who looked Palestinian out of their cars and putting them on the road. And I really thought, someone is gonna get killed here in the back of our live shot. You know, this might play out on, you know, we were doing specials, yes, we were yes. doing, we interrupt right. this program, and I just thought anything could happen here. And it was totally out of control then, and it stayed totally out of control for a long time after that. Mm -hmm. but the core of our audience at NBC News is based in the United States. Do you, how do you think about that as you're out reporting your stories through the course of the stories that you're telling? Yeah, it's a real challenge, right? right? Thousands of miles away, seven time zones, completely different context. But you do try to think about people in the U.S. and what are the reference points that are going to make sense, what needs to be explained, what's self-evident. The humanity kind of gets you through. You know, we did, there's a woman who's still in Gaza. She's called Noah Argamani. And everyone, even if they don't know her name, they'll know her face. She's the woman who was on the back of the motorcycle being taken away from the festival. You know, we interviewed her father pretty early in the war. He's speaking in Hebrew. And he's speaking, speaking, speaking. And you don't need any subtitles. You know exactly what this man is saying. His daughter has just been kidnapped. It's the same when there's a mother in Gaza who is sifting with her bare hands through the rubble, mm -hmm. trying to find her daughter's notebook because her daughter was killed in an Israeli airstrike. And the notebook is the only thing she can think of, you know, that's sort of a reminder of her daughter's short life. It, that stuff cuts through. Raf and Hala uh, just doing such incredible work here yeah. along with the rest of our team, Richard Engel and others who've been covering the story. And obviously, Yasmin, the focus is so much beyond us. It's what the story is. It's what we're covering here, which is this war now. But given that people who watch this show know that we do this segment with other correspondents, I think you've done it with us, um, we thought it was an opportunity to share some of those just sort of incredibly compelling moments from those two. And we're just so grateful to them for giving up a piece of their day, a short piece of their day to talk to us. Oh my gosh, that, that was so good. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily have insight in to what goes into conflict reporting like that and, and kind of what goes through all of our heads when we're having to report on those things and, and, and what you face. One of the things that really resonated with me was in talking about, and I'm sure for you, Hallie, as well, because, you know, you, you're a parachuter, right? You're, you're here mostly, uh, but you parachuted in um, mm -hmm. for a few weeks, and then you're going to leave, and you're going to go back to your beautiful family and celebrate the holidays with them, which I know you're very excited to do. But but kind of knowing what you're leaving behind and what um, people in, in both Israel and, and Gaza face and this never-ending, what seems to be never-ending war. And it's a particularly poignant time because think about what's happening right now here in Israel. I mean, everywhere. It's Hanukkah. Christmas is coming up. And you hear that invoked, right? You hear this moment that is supposed to be a celebration of family and friends and life and peace and miracles come up as we talk about, you know, what's happening uh, with these hostage families, the people whose loved ones have been held captive by Hamas. It comes up when you're looking at the situation um, and, you're, and you're talking to people about what's happening in Gaza here. And I just think about there's a woman who was at the White House just recently back, back home in Washington uh, whose loved one is being believed to be held, still unaccounted for. And she talked about wanting a Christmas miracle, sort of hoping mm. and praying for a Christmas miracle here. So um, the, the, the time, too, it's, it's, a, it's a somber time for obvious reasons. Um, and I think there is a real desire, especially when it comes to, for example, those hostage family members, a desperation to get something done. And I think when you look at what's happening in Gaza, absolute despair uh, that, that there's not more 
from what we hear from people there that's being done for them too, Yasmin. Mm. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.